chapters 1 through 6. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I give you the praise and I give you the glory for your word. It's your word, Lord God, that will break the, the bonds of, of every human being that alive. Only your word. It's in you, Lord, that we live and move and have our being. And so, Father, I'm asking you in Jesus' name. The blessing is already on your word. Bless the vessel that brings it forth. And I give you the glory in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. The book of Luke, reading from the Amplified Version, beloved, chapter 5, reading 1 through 5. Now it occurred that while the people pressed upon Jesus to hear the message of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats drawn up by the lake. But the fishermen had gone down from them and were washing their nets. And getting into one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon Peter, he requested him, now listen carefully, to draw away a little from the shore. Then he sat down and continued to teach the crowd of people from the boat. Now notice, to, he said to him, you do it. I'm not drawing away for you. This is important. There are certain times in life when God puts that on us. In other words, he'll say to us, you know what? You're not a baby Christian anymore. I'm telling you to draw away and you're going to have to do it. He, it is the finished work. We understand that. But there comes a time when we have to apply. We have to step out of the boat. We have to do it, not God. He's already done it. And then he'll put those requirements on us. So he requested him to draw away. You do it, Peter. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon Peter, put out or launch into the deep water. In other words, you do it. And you lower your nets for a haul. Can you believe, Peter? Do you believe me? Then you do it. And what happened here in verse 5? And Simon Peter answered, Master, we toiled all night exhaustingly. We caught nothing in our nets, but on the ground, watch this, oh, praise God, on the ground of your word. That is so powerful. We will read this and we just kind of skip over it. But there's so much intent, there's so much depth to what Jesus is saying, what Peter is saying back to his master. He's saying, on the ground of your word, I will lower the nets. Because you have spoken. Just like when he was in the boat and he heard Jesus say to him, come. He got one word from the Lord. But on the ground of one word, come, he was able to walk on the water until he realized what he was doing. And his flesh took a nosedive, simply put. But he had the faith. Has anybody else, anybody here even tried to walk in Lake Niagara? Hallelujah. At least Peter tried. Amen. Amen. And it was in the grounds of God's word. And verse 6, and when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish. And as their nets were at the point of breaking, breaking, they went on to say the signal to the other boats. They had more than enough for everybody around them. That's what happens when you hear from God, beloved. When you obey what he says to you, not only will you have enough for yourself, but it will be overflowing to your family, to your relatives, to, to your, your, your uh, workplace, to your community. That's what it's supposed to be about. We're supposed to be overflowing with the joy of the Lord. And if you don't have the joy, you don't have the strength. And that's why the devil tries to take your joy. Simple. So simple. Notice verse 3, draw away. And verse 4, launch out. You'll give up a lot if you decide to move forward. But you'll give up even more, beloved, if you stay where you are. Listen to one who has already been there. I've had choices in the last 40 years. Should I draw away? Should I launch out? Should I stay? I'm comfortable here, Lord. Do I need to make these changes in my life? Do I need to make the changes in the church? I'm in comfortable ground. No, you'll give up even more if you stay where you are. 
When his disciples had fished all night, we just read and caught nothing, Jesus said to them, launch out into the deep. What a challenge. Why was he saying that? The deep, beloved, is where the great catches are enjoyed. It's where the great storms are experienced. You can't have one without the other. You stay in the shallow water or you launch out into the deep. God says the decisions are still yours to make. You choose whether you look back or not. You choose whether you go out into the deep. It's called deep water faith. Deep water faith. We must make the decision. We see that after they had fished all night, they had caught nothing. Well, it was normal for Peter to say what he said. Lord, you got to be kidding me. Where's the fish? We have been out all night. And Jesus said, launch out. Let down your nets. The real test of, test of faith, beloved, comes when, one, all you know and everything you've ever tried doesn't work. Anyone ever been there? Am I the only one? Let me see your hands. Is anybody else? Yes, the whole church. Two, the Lord speaks a word to you that seems to make no sense whatsoever. And beloved, from my experience, and I'm not there, I'm just on the right road, that's all. I haven't arrived yet. But from my experience, when God has told me to do things, it's always been what makes no sense to my natural mind. And I always reply by, why me, Lord? And he replies back, why not you? Okay, listen to, to Peter's response. Nevertheless, at that, I will let down the net. That's it. We need to come to a place where we doubt our doubts, but never doubt God. One word from him can change everything. And it did. And when this they had done, they, they enclosed a great multitude of fish and their nets were at the point of breaking. There are four lessons here for us today, beloved. One, he will involve you in one thing to teach you another. Soon he was going to involve them in an even bigger miracle, catching multitudes and bringing them into his kingdom. I've over the years ministered to a lot of people that believed they had were called of God to the ministry, and many, many of them were. But everyone, including myself at one time, wanted to uh, arrive overnight. When God spoke to me about what he was going to do with my life, I thought it would be done within a year. Ha, ha, ha. LOL, as we say today. Okay? Because I wasn't anywhere ready for that kind of a promotion from God. I wasn't a mentally, spiritually, physically, any other way. It took time, and I'm still walking in that, waiting for many things that God has spoken to me. But over the years, you know, I would have people come to me and say, Oh, Pastor, God's called me to do this. I've got a worldwide ministry, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And I'm gonna... I thought I'd had everybody in the world saved in three months. It's a little exaggeration, but you know what I mean. And I would say to that person, really? I don't doubt it for a moment. So where are we going to begin? Well, I got to get a chance at the pulpit. Or you got to teach me. No, 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 dear. What you got to do is start cleaning the toilets. Yeah. Huh? But I'm called to the ministry. Really? That's what the ministry is. Jesus himself said, and listen to these words, the greatest among you, will be servant of all. Oh, but I've never cleaned a toilet. Well, now's the time to find out what it's like. Because you're looking at a lady that's cleaned the toilets. She's washed those bathroom floors. She's vacuumed up this floor. Uh-huh. And I could add another 10 to 20 things onto that list. Early on a Sunday morning, she shoveled the driveway. Not the driveway, but the front to let people in. I've taken out the flowers as they're starting to decay, when I'd see it. I've watered the plants. I've walked into the ladies' bathrooms and the men's bathrooms to make sure that first impressions are lasting and they're clean and tidy. And for the most part, they are. We have great servants in this house. I'm trying to say something to us all today. When you launch out into the deep, make sure you launch out as a servant. Make sure you're prepared to do the mundane things in life, even in your own families. 
You, are you prepared to do in your home what you ask your children to do? Are you prepared to do in the workplace, if you're an employer, what, what, that you ask your employees to do? Because this is what this is all about, beloved. It's not about the acclimates of men. It's not about strutting, okay? It's about bending the knee. It's about being a servant. And so Peter's response was that of a servant. I don't know what to do, Lord, but at your word, at your word, I will obey. So he'll involve you in one thing so that you can start to feed the multitudes and bring them into his kingdom. But you're going to have to be faithful in the little things. I remember one time years ago, a person came to me and said, well, I'm believing God for a new car. I said, really? He said, oh, yeah. He says, that's, that's what the word of faith is all about, right? I said, no, you're wrong. That's not what the word of God, faith is all about. The, Paul preached the word of faith. Faith worketh by love and, and et cetera, et cetera. I could go into a dozen scriptures right now, but I won't. But what I did say to him, I said, well, I said, so you believe in God for a car? Yeah. Do you tithe? No. What's that got to be, do with it? I said, then let's not go any further. I'll ask you one other question. Do, have you ever believed God for a pair of socks? He said, no. I said, then don't ever think you're going to get a car. I said, because cars are a big investment for somebody to bless you if you're not obeying God. And I've seen people in this church, believe me, God's taken me this way and I'm just moving with it. I've, I've seen people in this church who have been blessed abundantly because they obey the spirit of God in their giving, in their almsgiving, and in their offerings. People have been given cars in this church. People have been given rent money. They have been given places to stay. I have watched all of that over the years, but it comes with obeying God first. You can't just read a scripture, my God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God, I need a new car. I don't want a secondhand car. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, I, I need a new car. After all, I'm your child and I'm, it's crazy. Launch out, yes. Make sure you've got a word of God to launch out with. Peter had a word of God to launch out with. He said, launch out. Oh, glory. Somebody's getting something here today, I'll tell you that. Because I have no intentions of going here. But anyway, so the second thing that he will do is he'll use the familiar to do the incredible. In their workplace, the disciples' workplace, their fishing boat. There was nothing ever special ever happened in that boat. And he suddenly showed up and changed everything. Look for him today, beloved, in the familiar, in the unexpected places of your life. And number three, he'll move you from the security of the shore to the risks of the deep. Why? Because you've got to risk the great storms if you're going to enjoy the great catches. No risks, no rewards. Oh, Pastor Pat, but you just don't know. I don't have the education. I don't have this. I can't do that. I mean, I was, I, you know, I wasn't raised in the, the right atmosphere. Really? Come on. God doesn't need your help. He just needs your heart. Not all your qualifications. And even going for a job, if you don't have all of these great qualifications, God can open doors for you because of your faithfulness that no man can ever shut. You can sit in a place, yes, give Jesus a hand. You can be sitting in a place of employment and saying in your heart, Lord, I have favor, I have favor, I have favor with this man, I have favor with this woman, I've done the things that are right with you, Lord, I know that I'm pleasing you, da, 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 and all of a sudden, this person will offer you a job, and when you walk out the door, they'll say to themselves, why did I do that? I've experienced this, I've seen this. Why did I offer her that? Why did I do this for her? And it's not in me, beloved, it's in you too, it's all of us. Oh, glory. Well, 
So no risk, no reward. When you obey God, number four, nets will break. Net needs are met. You will move forward and he will be glorified. But remember, the miracle can't begin until you say, nevertheless, at thy word, I will. Yes, Lord, I will decide to do this. I will decide, Lord God. You say, well, pastor, it's not easy. That's right. It's not easy. But it is if you do it in God's time. And when God speaks to your heart, you will know the benefits of this. Trust me. It's all in his time. It's not easy to break with the past. The new Christians in Ephesus brought out all their old books of witchcraft, pornography, all of these other things, and burned them in the town square. And when they did, beloved, a riot broke out. Remember, change is inevitable, but growth is optional. You'll either fight it or you'll flow with it. But know this, if you're not willing to leave Egypt, you'll never get to the promised land. Hang it up. You've got to leave behind first before you can go forward. In 1 Chronicles 4.10, it says these words. Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldst bless me indeed and enlarge my coast. And God granted him that which he requested. Here we see the spirit of Jabez. His mother named him Jabez, which means painkiller or pain maker, excuse me, it should have been painkiller. He needed painkillers. <laughs> pain maker. Pain maker. How would you like that label every time you walk, woke up every morning? How would you like to be called Jabez, pain maker? I don't think so. Can you be, imagine being called it? You talk, about, you talk about growing up with an inferiority complex, but it's a label, listen carefully, it was a label that he refused to wear and a prophecy he refused to fulfill. In that chapter, you have a long list of people who just lived and died until you get to Jabez. He wouldn't settle for that. In a world where you can either blend in or stand out, he wanted his life to mean something. Your life can mean something today. You just be the best mother you've ever been. Be the best daddy you've ever been. Be the, be, when, you, when you go to be with Jesus, people are going to cry and truly mean it at your funeral. Be the best employee. Be the blessed em best employer. Be the best neighbor. Be the best sister, brother, aunt, uncle. Whatever. You fill in the blanks. Do the best. Don't just live a life and get to the end and say, I wish I had done that. What I said last week, the could have been, the would have been, the should have been, the if onlys. I refuse to live that way. I'm going to live my life to the fullest and enjoy every minute of it. As much as I possibly can. Yes, I have my moments. Yes, I have my challenges. But that just makes me human. But thank God for the supernatural person that's inside of me that makes me superhuman when I need to be. Amen. So he cried to the Lord, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my coast. And God granted him what he requested. That's a prayer, beloved, that God will answer for you too if you pray it. All of us, I don't care who you are, what is your occupation in life, I'm telling you the facts. All of you will be remembered for two things. The problems, one, you that you, um, the problems that you solve, and two, the problems that you create. That's what you'll be remembered for at the end of the day. How many problems you solved and how many problems you created. How many lives did you change because you helped somebody? Or how many lives did you destroy because of what you created? But the good news is, when you come to Jesus, you can put all that behind you. And when you come out of these baptismal waters today, it's sealed. It's sealed. It can't be brought up against you again, and the enemy of your soul knows it. God is looking for people who want to make a difference where they live. 
You don't need to have a pulpit. You don't need to be the CEO of a company. You don't have to be the, the supervisor of here, there, and everywhere. All you need to do is be who God created you to be and do the best you can do to do that. That's what you need. That's what you need. You say, well, you know, I have not. Stop that whining. I've said this to you before. The Bible says, arise, shine, don't arise, whine. For the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Just do the best you can do with your life. And let me tell you something. One of the greatest things that can happen, well, you, it can happen to you is at the end of your, your days, your family are just good, good people. You say, but pastor, I'm not living that right now. And I didn't have that kind of family. That can change this moment. You don't have to do what your parents or their parents or their parents did. That curse was broken at Calvary. Oh, hallelujah. I hope you're getting something here today. So, God's looking for people who will make a difference. The Bible says that his eyes are running to and fro over the whole earth to show himself strong on their behalf. On whose behalf? Whose heart is perfect towards him. It's not about works. Oh, that's involved, yes, but God looks beyond the fault and sees the need every step of the way. How many times he shook his head at me? How many times he shook his head and said, there you go again. When will you ever learn to shut mouth? But no, you just want to keep in certain foot. I should have been called Patria for Peter instead of Patricia because I'm more like the apostle Peter I see than anybody else. He rushed on. Everybody else took the time. He opened his mouth. But I'll tell you something. What Jesus said about Peter. Go find Peter. Go get him. I saw his repentance. I heard what he said. And I love him. You go find him. You know what he was saying? I created Peter that way. And you know something, beloved? <laughs> when I came to the place in my life, that I realized that God created me just the way I was. And I was to stop letting everybody else change me. When he wanted me changed, he would change me. So yes, Pastor Dave, when he was in my life, was a steady balance for me. I ran on and he pulled me back. I've still got others that will do that on occasion family members that I trust and that I can receive from. But it doesn't change your very nature. Do you hear what I'm saying today? I am, as the Apostle Paul said it better than I'll ever do, I am what I am by the grace of God. And he teaches me, he checks me, he tells me, no, 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 this is the way, child, walk ye in it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So whose heart is perfect towards him? So you say then, why does God not bless me more? Well, you may find your answer in these questions. Number one, have you acknowledged the blessings that he's already given you? Have you used the gifts he's already entrusted to you? Second question, have you sought him with all your heart? Concerning your future and your past. I'm speaking to me today. You may be old. I don't consider myself old, but I certainly have lived a lot longer than I'm going to live. But you may be old, but you don't have to stop growing. The minute I put down a book, I stop growing. The minute I don't listen to wise counsel, I stop growing. The minute I'd stop listening to the word, whichever way via television and my car or whatever, I stop growing. You always have to, that's why Paul said at the end of his days, bring me the parchments, bring me the books. He wanted to put into the next generation. He never stopped growing. Until you talk to the one 
who holds your future, you'll never be able to move with confidence towards your destiny. So beloved, talk to him today. Tell him, I'm not looking back. I'm moving forward. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Psalm 34, 3. David wrote a declaration of God's greatness. The word magnify means to enlarge. The problem is that our, the, we think the problem is so big, but we need to understand that our concept of God is too small. There's nothing too difficult for your God. And I don't make light of any situation in this house today. I know as the pastor, there's some serious things going on in some of your lives. I don't make light of that. But I tell you before God Almighty, don't you ever, ever, ever give up on God. He can move a mountain in two seconds when you least expect it. The following words are a declaration. Begin repeating them over your circumstances and watch what happens. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. He is the first. He is the last. He is the beginning and he is the end. He is the keeper of creator, creation. He is the creator of the universe. He's the manager of all times. He always was, always is, always will be. The world can't understand him. Its armies can't defeat him. Its schools can't explain him. Its leaders can't ignore him. Herod couldn't kill him. The Pharisees couldn't confuse him. Nero couldn't crush him. Hitler couldn't silence him. He's the power of the powerful, the ancient of days, the ruler of rulers, the leader of leaders. He is holy, mighty, and true. His ways are right, his word eternal. And he, will un he is unchanging. He is redeemer, savior, lord, and guide. When I fail, he forgives. When I I am weak, he is strong. When I am lost, he's on the way. And when I'm afraid, he is my courage. When I stumble, he steadies me. When I'm broken, he mends me. When I face persecution, he shields me. When I face loss, he provides for me. When I face death, he carries me home. Hallelujah. He said it. That settles it. He is on my side. God is in control. And because of that, it is well with my soul. Decide today, beloved, to move on. Courage is fear that has said its prayers and decided to go forward anyway. That's what it's all about. I'm closing in a moment. Before I close, I want to say, many as you can, many of you as you can, stay and encourage these new people getting baptized. It's a big day for them. If you can, it will be a blessing to you. It will be a tremendous blessing to you. So I'm closing with a little bit of humor. It's called subject baptizing. After a hardy rainstorm, and most of us have experienced that today, I'm going to be honest with you. The front of my house for two days was uh, like a river. You could literally, on the street, you could literally sail a boat down. So I was looking outside and I thought, you know, Lord, it would be funny if I just called the whole church over here and baptized them right in that river. <laughs> but I didn't. I didn't. And the river's dry now. My street's dry. But literally, no cars could come in and no cars could go out. Once I was in my house, and, and the truth is, I got back from a place of business, 10 minutes later, they, they came from the city and put all these things up and if, if, you know, barricades and what have you and cones and what have you. Ten minutes I was in my house. If I hadn't gotten in then, I would never have gotten in because I wasn't about to take my car through that. So God is good. So I'm closing. After a hard, hard day rainstorm filled all the pots holes in the street, and the alleys, a young mother watched her two little boys playing in the puddle through her kitchen window. The older of the two, a five-year-old lad, grabbed his sibling by the back of his head and shoved his face into the water hole. As the boy recovered and stood laughing and dripping, the mother ran out to the yard in a panic. Why on earth did you do that to your little brother, she said. We were just playing church, mommy, he said, and I was baptizing him. What? She said, he said, in the name of the Father and the Son and in the hole he goes. <laughs> Glory 
it to God. <laughs> I'll tell you, as, uh, I, I'm telling you right now, beloved, you, you need to keep your sense of humor. You just need to keep your sense of humor. It's, it's what's going to get you through in life. But anyway, uh, I do want to remind uh, the congregation that next, uh, those who are being baptized, next Sunday you will be presented with your baptismal certificate and your complimentary DVD. Amen? So without any further, I'm going to ask the music now to come up, please. And, and I, I ask you to bow your heads in reverence to the Lord as we pray together and then I will leave the platform and go get my white gown on <laughs> and everyone else will come out. We will have uh, our brother here come down here with your wheelchair and then we're going to bring that other chair over for the other congregant that will be, be baptized. Father, I thank you and I praise you, O God, and I give you the glory. Have your way, Holy Spirit, in this baptismal service. Have your way with these precious ones that are going to be baptized, that have decided to follow Jesus all the way. And Lord, right now, if there be one person in this room that does not know you, I ask that you would touch their hearts right now in the name of Jesus. If there be one here with every head bowed and every eye closed that would say, Pastor, that's me. I need to know Jesus as my Savior. And I want to make him my Lord. Could I see your hand? I'm not asking you to come up forward. I just want to see your hand. If I, yeah, I need to pray for you, I'll do it right from here. Anybody, anywhere, Pastor Sandy, over there, okay? Praise God. Anyone, anywhere else? There's two over there, okay. Bless the Lord. Anyone else? Okay, I think so, yes. Okay, one more I thought I saw. Okay, well, bless the Lord. Those of you who are, I'm going to pray for now, you can see Pastor Sandy before you leave. She'll have a little booklet for you. She'll also have a gift for you if you came here for the first time today or never received one before. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, today I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me my sins. I give you my life today. I ask you to come into my life. And this day, I believe I am saved and I make you my Lord. And if you said that for the first time, God bless you. We love you and welcome to the, to the body of Christ.